Hey everybody, video here for you today, and I'll probably have another one from Cali, one last one when we recorded on Tuesday night, coming up a little later. But today we are going to get a little tour around the Sphinx from John Anthony West, and I've always said I will keep his memory alive on my channel. We're going down to Giza here today, and this is a clip from my friend Carlos's channel, and I appreciate him letting me use clips from his videos, and I will leave the full video link below. Mr. West talks a little bit about Serpent in the Sky, and I've had some questions about books to read about Egypt, and Serpent in the Sky was uh, very influential. Bef right before I started making videos, I read that, and I love Mr. West's humor, and he was just a great influence on me as far as wanting to make videos and getting back at the standard model of history and the people who kind of are Kind of have blinders on and don't accept a uh, deeper history than we are taught. Here we are down at the Sphinx and Mr. West goes over the erosion and talks a little Robert Schock, also the repair blocks in the old kingdom and how that doesn't make any sense. Also, he talks about the gods and the king's list a little bit and a deeper history according to the Egyptians. He starts his tour from right down here, so let's get started. Familiar. That the Sphinx is much, much older. The theory is that the Sphinx is much, much older than dynastic Egypt, which, as you probably know, begins around 3200 BC. The proof of that, and it's a long story, but I'll only talk, just touch the high points of it. My own work is based upon the work of an extraordinary French genius with the unpronounceable name R. H. Roller de Lewis who spent years on, on site, mostly at Luxor Temple, putting together what both adherents and, and opponents call the symbolist interpretation of Egypt, which in fact sees a high sacred science where the academic community, which I tend to call the quackademic community, <laughs> um, sees a technologically, rather, sees architecturally accomplished superstition. In one of his later books, Schwaller was talking about the chronology of Egypt. The Egyptians themselves, the ancient Egyptians, um, called attention in, in several texts. One, a, 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 a chronological uh, stela, or tablet, stone from the inside, that's a stela. Um, and another, a papyrus, rather fragmentary, but both these documents talk about earlier, long earlier periods where Egypt was ruled first by the Necheru, that is to say the gods themselves, the gods to be understood not as figments of the superstitious imagination, but as the embodiments or <coughs> manifestations of cosmic principles. Um, and then almost as an afterthought, at the very end of this long chapter, said, of course, the Great Sphinx of, Sh of Giza shows unmistakable signs of aquatic erosion water weathering. And when I read that, I was working on my own book, Serpent in the Sky, which is designed to introduce the English, English-speaking people to, um, to Schwaller's work, which was uh, only in French at that time and impenetrable in any language, pretty much. He tried reading unadulterated Schwaller. It's like taking your first driving lesson in a Ferrari. Um, anyhow, that registered with me because everything else that he was talking about was a textual argument, interesting certainly, but not science. Uh, the water weathering of the Sphinx was potentially science. Uh, and if you could prove that, you could prove something very important. It's not just a quibble amongst academics because I think you get the sense here, I don't think anybody would argue, or probably not argue much, that the Great Sphinx is, is probably the greatest statue on Earth. If, if it's proven that the Sphinx is weathered by water, and it's proven that it dates, we can't date it yet um, specifically, but it's somewhere older than 10,000 BC, it means that everything you've ever learned in any school anywhere in the world about the origins of human civilization <coughs> is completely wrong. I mean, not only is it, it's, it's, it's totally wrong and it's reversed. In other words, they could do what we can't do um, yeah, we can build hydrogen bombs and we've got bobblehead dolls and striped toothpaste and all kinds of wonderful things like that. But we couldn't build a temple like that even if we wanted to and we don't want to. 
but it still wasn't science because I'm not a scientist. Uh, it turned out I did a pretty good job. I made a, only a couple of big mistakes. It took another 10 years before I finally encountered Robert Schock, my now good friend and colleague, who was a young but very impeccably credentialed geologist with a sort of triple PhD from Yale in, in geology, geophysics, and paleontology. And it took another more long story to get him interested enough to come to um, to Egypt with me to take a look at the at the weathering and to, to, to pronounce on whether or not it was indeed water weathered. And it was funny. He, he used this when he first walked in. Um, he, we came in, and as you see, this is pretty impressive to come down here. Um, and it was just, I forget exactly how we got permission or if we boxed our way in. We were in all by ourselves early in the morning, and Chuck walked around with me, and okay, follow me now. We'll get here. So we got, we got to about, we got to about here. And so anybody else, you're walking around here, if you weren't with me, you wouldn't probably think twice to look at the side wall there, you'd be looking at the Sphinx, at the art, not at the rocks. Jacques is a geologist, so what he's looking at are the rocks. And you walk in, you've got a view of this here, a little bit closer than we are now, and you all of a sudden stop, and he said, oh, wow. He said, these rocks look like they're hundreds of thousands of years old. And he said, ooh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> now, now, 20, what's it, more than 20 years later, because he, he hadn't yet, um, conceded, as it were, that it had to be water weathering. Initially, he couldn't believe that the geologists hadn't noticed that before because it was so absolutely obvious. But now he's perfectly okay with maybe not hundreds of thousands, but old, 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 beyond any possible, <coughs> by, I mean, impossible to place within any kind of a contemporary framework. In, in one sense, you could say, that argument is, so what? What does it have to do with the price of eggs or the price of Ferraris or anything like that? Actually, a lot in, in, in I mean, you, I don't think there's anyone here who thinks other than that we're living in a lunatic asylum, which is breaking apart as we, as um, we watch it. But at the end of a couple of weeks here, what you end up with is an unshakable unshakable understanding of the difference between civilization and progress. They're almost antithetical. Damn near. And you don't think of that otherwise because we're all brought up to think that we're the smartest people that ever were. And for a couple of weeks here you get to understand that, yeah, we can do certain technological things that probably they couldn't do what they wouldn't have wanted to do. And they not only can do things, they did things that were in, that were infinitely more important and they did them for 3,000 years. I mean, we've had, a, we've had our, our own society, at least in America, going for a couple of hundred years and it's, it's, it's coming apart at the seams, obviously. Every time you pick up the newspaper, there's something that's making it worse. So that's, this is actually the lesson of Egypt, the difference between a spiritually based civilization that, that has as its focus, single issue civilization, it's the quest for immortality. The, the quackademics would say the Egyptians believed, uh, wink, wink, nod, nod, that mm -hmm. there is such a thing as immortality. They know better, of course. Um, and I would say that it's not that the Egyptians believed. It never occurs to these guys to think, hey, maybe they knew and um, they proof of it. <laughs> so now when you see, actually, the, when you're standing here, even from where we were standing before, you couldn't really get a good sense of the severity of this weathering. This is when shot when he saw this, he said, Gosh, this looks like hundreds of thousands of years. Well, we don't know. One of our aims sometime soon is to get a bunch of uncommitted geologists to really come out here for a couple of weeks and study the, the weathering. It's not the Sphinx isn't the only... Um, isn't the only piece of evidence. There are a number of pieces scattered around the Giza Plateau and also in Saqqara and elsewhere. <coughs> and it wasn't until I got here with shock, one mistake I'd made, one big mistake in, uh, in my, my original 
um, developing of the theory was that <coughs> I couldn't even see, I, for a variety of reasons, I was convinced that it was water weathering, but it never occurred to me that it was rainwater weathering. And this was, Schock was able to point that out because you see the verticals there, and the verticals here, that can only be, that can only occur if, for example, if this were, if this were all enclosed and it were a lake, and it was all, it was all standing water, you wouldn't get those verticals. The verticals come in because it's water coursing down the plateau. The plateau goes back up that way, you notice, as we came down in the bus. And it's tilted like, if you can imagine a, like a, like a <coughs> ping pong table that's tilted west to east and then north to south so that it's like this. And the water coming down, and this is where we want our panel of geologists, lots and lots of water is coming down over long periods of time, almost certainly bouncing off the causeway. There's the ruins of the causeway up on top. And it's spilling over this, this third of the Sphinx enclosure wall, much more so than the other enclosed, the, the, the far end, the, uh, the eastern end of the enclosure wall. And what that's producing, because even what you're looking at here is illusory because the, the original line, come back here. Okay, now turn around and you get sort of where I am. And, and, and sight down here. You see, this is, the, the layers are laid down north, south, um, north, south, um, west, east as well. So that this is, this is a much harder <coughs> layer of limestone. And that's a much softer layer of limestone and the head itself is a still harder outcrop of limestone. But where I'm standing here is the original profile of the enclosure wall, right? It was once out to here. So it's weathered from here to there. That's a lot of weathering. Mm -hmm. And the, the GSA called a press conference and the, the, the whole the science press of the world was there for whatever reason, because they're not always at these things. And we had this huge international flood of headlines and uh, all over the place, most of them actually pretty respectful, um, except for the, uh, the archaeologists and the Egyptologists were sh you know, shouting and screaming and mm -hmm. abusing us and all the rest of it. And Schock teaches at Boston University, so the science editor of the Boston Globe called us up. He wasn't at the presentation, but he called us up to say, you know, what's all this about? So Schock had a long interview with him, and then I had an interview with him. And, and he said, well, you know, why is it that the geologists all seem to agree with this, but why is it that the archaeologists and the Egyptologists are so, get so angry about this? And I said, well, it doesn't matter why they're so, that angry. Um, the argument is about the weathering patterns in rocks. And when it comes to weathering patterns in rocks, an Egyptologist's opinion is no better than a proctologist's. <laughs> and he printed that. And that, that got the archaeological and Egyptological community even angrier. <laughs> and there was a, a woman um, professor at uh, Shock's College uh, who wrote the scathing personal denunciation of Shock for the in-house Boston University <coughs> paper, um, you know, journal, whatever they call it. And, I mean, it was really nasty. And I said to Shock, you know, Shock, you really should respond to that. And he said, no, 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 I'll just let it ride and uh, not roil the waters any further. So I said, well, I'll write her a personal letter. <laughs> so I wrote a personal letter. And, and I said to her, you know, I understand that everyone in the archaeology, the Egyptology department is very angry about this proctologist remark. I said, the proctologists didn't like it either. <laughs> they say their job is to cure sick assholes. They don't like being compared to them. <laughs> so, and it won't be long now before with the archaeologists and the Egyptologists, because by the time we've finished, they'll have eaten so much crow, it'll be an endangered species. So, <laughs> okay? That's it. Any questions? Oh, who said four? Sorry. <laughs> Where, point out what's original and what isn't original here. Um, and the repair blocks. Actually, important point. Obviously, all, above the repair blocks is the weathering. That's the core body of the strength.
Then there are several, many stages of repair. And this is, again, a complicated subject, but architectural styles, in architectural, if you take a course in, in, in not sorry, in, yeah, in architectural art history, certain styles are associated with certain periods of construction. And there's no mistaking, for example, a medieval fortress is a medieval fortress. It's not a Roman fortress, and it's not an Egyptian fortress. So these repair campaigns have their own style. So these big ones on the bottom here are typically Old Kingdom. That means somewhere between, the Sphinx is supposedly carved in 2450 or thereabouts, 2500 BC, the, the Old Kingdom ends in 2200 BC. So it means that, and even, even Lehner acknowledges that and some of them, that the Sphinx was weathered to its present condition when the first repair blocks mm. were applied. But if the fir first repair blocks were applied within a couple of hundred years of the Sphinx, of the Sphinx's being carved, this is an absurdity. I mean, there's, there's no possible way that you can <coughs> defend that scientifically. That is my video from Mr. John Anthony West. I thoroughly recommend Serpent in the Sky for those of you interested in Egypt and want a book to read, and I think there is an online version, but I talked about the Sphinx in a video a day or two ago, so I just thought I would upload this, keep the memory of that great man alive. All of us doing videos today, so a lot of us are just legacies of his. We would not be making videos if John Anthony West hadn't done his initial research on the Sphinx, so that was a good one to upload. And you all have. Very nice.